uh, from the University of California, San Diego. And she's going to speak to us about uh, microvascular adaptations and exercise endurance. Okay, thank you, Tara. And uh, thank you to the organizers for putting on such an interesting conference. I've really learned a lot. Um, today, I'm going to talk about microvascular adaptations and exercise endurance. I'm actually going to show you a couple of different conditions or scenarios where we change the microvascular and see how it affects your endurance capacity. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the oxygen transport system is an integrated system, and we all know that it depends on how well your heart functions, how your lungs are ventilating, but um, we're going to focus on the last steps of the oxygen transport system because we want to know how oxygen gets from the capillary to that vast network of mitochondria in the myofiber. So oxygen is a key determinant of exercise endurance. And in the muscle, you can regulate it several ways. You can regulate the number of capillaries that are associated with each skeletal myofiber. But you can also regulate the red blood cell dynamics. So the, the number of red blood cells, the velocity of these red blood cells, how they're distributed in the microvascular bed. For oxygen to get from the um, hemoglobin into the red blood cell, there are several diffusion barriers. The oxygen has to go through the plasma. It has to cross the endothelial cell membrane, which is coated with these branch sugar chains, often referred to as the glycocalyx has to go through the interstitium, be taken up by the myofiber, and be made available to all those mitochondria that are in the myofiber. So we know that it just takes one exercise bout to increase the expression and the release of angiogenic factors. And these are some of the early ones that we looked at. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor, and TGF beta. And you can see for all these factors, immediately after just a single exercise bout, these were rats that were run on a treadmill for an hour, that there is an increase in the mRNAs of these factors, but by eight hours, it's gone back to resting or, or baseline levels. So it's a transient response. So our lab is focused for quite some time on this particular growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. And what we wanted to know is, is VEGF important for the exercise training response? So we conditionally deleted VEGF in the skeletal myofibers of adult mice. And here I'm just showing you a, a couple of muscles, but it, it, we've looked at several muscles there's a big decrease in the VEGF levels. So most of the VEGF in your skeletal muscle is expressed in the, or the content is in the myofibers itself. And then we exercise train the mice. So we exercise them on a treadmill five days a week for eight weeks. And during this time, we exercise tested them along the protocol. So we exercise tested them before we gave them tamoxifen to induce the gene deletion. And then we exercise tested them three weeks later when the VEGF levels are down, and you can see there's a decrease in endurance capacity. And then we exercise trained them for eight weeks. So as you would expect, there's an increase in their endurance times on the treadmill, but this response is pretty much completely blocked in the skeletal myofiber VEGF deficient mice. So it looks like VEGF is important for the exercise training response. Okay, so then we looked at their capillaries. So if you focus on the top panel, we looked at several muscles in the hind limb, the soleus, the plantaris, the gastroct, and the EDL. And in a wild-type mice, we saw a significant increase in two of these muscles, the plantaris and the gastrocnemius. In our skeletal myofiber VEGF-deficient mice, this response was partially blocked in the plantaris, 1.33 to 1.61 and completely blocked in the gastroc, 1.18 to 1.63. So we see a differential response, but it does look like VEGF is important for this exercise-induced angiogenesis. Okay, so if we go back and look at that earlier time point, before the mice are exercise trained at three weeks, we did see a decrease in their endurance capacity. This response doesn't last. If we look at a later time point at eight weeks, 
we no longer see this decrease in endurance capacity. And at all these times, if we look at several different muscles, there is no change in the capillary to fiber ratio. So we have a decrease in endurance capacity that's not dependent on the number of capillaries. So we were interested in seeing what was going on here. Okay, so in this experiment, what we did is we wanted to measure the fatigue response of the muscle. But we didn't just want to look at the contractile properties of the muscle. We wanted to do a preparation where the muscle microvascular system was still perfused. So we did this experiment in situ, and we stimulated the um, muscle to contract, and then we measured the time to reach a fatigue point. So you can see in the VGF knockout mice, their fatigue times or their time to fatigue was much shorter. They fatigued faster than the wild type mice. To more directly look at this, we wanted to measure the contraction induced perfusion of that microvascular bed. And so we again stimulated the gastrocnemius complex to contract. And we compared that to the contralateral leg that was not contracted or resting. And we, when we Perform this contraction bout, we delivered small 20 nanometer spheres that were fluorescently labeled, and then we optically imaged the mouse over time. So here I'm representing this data as the ratio between the stimulated leg and the resting leg. And you can see that pretty much immediately there's an increased perfusion of the, the capillaries in the stimulated leg that reaches a plateau and even remains high when you stop the stimulation. This response was pretty much completely blocked in our VEGF knockout mice, so our skeletal myofiber VEGF deficient mice, which suggests that VEGF has a role in regulating the perfusion of the capillaries. Okay, one of the reasons that we are interested in understanding how you regulate your capillary number or the function of your microvascular is that um, many patients who have chronic diseases, like chronic heart failure or chronic kidney disease, we've focused in on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, have an exercise intolerance. And this affects their quality of life and their lifespan. So VEGF signaling is inhibited in these mice. There's a decrease in the basal levels of VEGF, and there's a decrease in the acute VEGF response to exercise. Some of these patients observe a capillary regression or a capillary loss. Okay, so we asked one question. If there is so much VEGF in the skeletal myofibers, maybe this was supporting the VEGF that's expressed by the endothelial cell that's going to go on to make the capillary. So we did an experiment where we targeted VEGF gene deletion, again, to the skeletal myofiber or to the endothelial cell or we knocked out the gene in both cells at the same time. And then we measured their capillary to fiber ratio in several, several different muscles. Um, but the bottom line is that there's no change in the capillary number. So once you have mature capillaries formed in an adult mice, in a healthy mouse, it doesn't seem to require expression of VEGF in the endothelial cell or the myofiber. One muscle that is dependent on VEGF is the diaphragm. So again, we used our skeletal myofiber VEGF deficient mice. And in the diaphragm, we see a decrease in the capillary to fiber number. We also see a decrease in the size of the fibers, the um, fiber circumference surface area, that FCSA. And this seems to be more predominant in the type 1 fibers than the type 2 fibers. So this is interesting because your diaphragm is always active. In a way, it's always exercising. And so when it, when it stops, like if, if you're on a ventilator, it, it changes very quickly. Okay, whoops. Okay, and so in these next few slides, I'm going to show you some data where we expose mice to cigarette smoke. So mice were exposed to daily periods of cigarette smoke for either 8 or 16 weeks. And under these conditions, we see a decrease in VEGF mRNA and VEGF protein. But this only occurs in the oxidative soleus muscle, but not the more glycolytic EDL muscle. There is a high inflammatory burden in these mice. They have a high level of circulating uh, TNF-alpha levels. 
We also saw a decrease in PGC1-alpha mRNA, again, only in the soleus muscle, but not in the EDL muscle. And if we cultured C2, C12 myoblasts and treated them with TNF-alpha, there's a dose-dependent decrease in PGC1-alpha expression. Okay, so now under these conditions where we have a high inflammatory burden and we have a lower VHF expression, now we do see a loss of capillaries or a decrease in the capillary to fiber ratio. Again, this only occurs in the oxidative soleus muscle, but not the EDL. We can do this experiment a couple of different ways. We can either expose the mice to cigarette smoke, or we can make an extract of the cigarette smoke components and directly inject it into the bloodstream. And under both conditions, we see a loss of capillaries or a decrease in the capillary to fiber ratio. With cigarette smoke, we also start to see a lot of changes in the myofiber itself. In this um, panel here, I'm showing that there's a loss in muscle satellite cells, or the PAC7 positive nestin positive cells. And this occurs with skeletal myofiber VEGF gene deletion or cigarette smoke exposure. These were in um, soleus fibers. Okay, again, we went to um, look at the fatigue or the function of the muscle, and we used our in situ gastrocnemius prep, and we saw a decrease in the um, fatigue times in both the cigarette smoke exposed mice and the cigarette smoke extract um, injected mice. We were starting to see changes in the muscle myofibers itself. There's a fiber type transition we see the accumulation of type 2B fibers and the loss of type 2A fibers. Again, this only occurs in the soleus, but not in the EDL. And in this preparation, we use isolated muscles, either the soleus or the EDL, so we've removed the capillaries or the microvessels, and we measure their force-frequency relationship. And you can see that there's a decrease in the force that both muscles can produce but it's more prominent in the soleus than the EDL. We did a fatigue bout with these isolated muscle preparations, and there's a, a, a fatigue a decrease or increase in the fatigue in the soleus compared to the EDL. Okay, in this experiment, what we did was isolate single fibers from the FDB muscle and um, these fibers were isolated from mice that were administrated, administrated cigarette smoke extract or our control mice. And we loaded the um, single fibers with Fura 2 so we could measure calcium kinetics. Okay, so in this panel here, this is during a contraction bout or repeated contractions. We saw an increase in the peak calcium, the peak contraction. We see an increase in the, in the calcium levels. We also measured the basal, basal calcium levels, and there was an accumulation of basal calcium in the cigarette extract fibers compared to the control. And with this type of data, we can estimate the sarcoplasmic calcium pumping, and this is blunted in our cigarette smoke extract mice compared to the control. Okay, so just to sum up what I've showed you so far, we know with exercise, we think that VEGF plays a role in the perfusion of the capillary beds, and with repeated exercise training, there's an increase in the number of capillaries. Both of these um, changes can bring more oxygen available to the mitochondria to fuel cycles of contraction and relaxation and improve your endurance exercise capacity. With cigarette smoke exposure, we see changes in bo both the microvascular system and the myofiber. There's a high inflammatory burden, and now we see a loss of capillaries and decreased VEGF expressions. Um, there's a fiber type transition. There's lots of changes that occur in the muscle, but the ones that I've showed you today are a fiber type transition, a loss of muscle satellite cells, and impaired calcium handling. Okay, so I'd like to show you one more experiment where we took our clues from thinking about human evolution. <clears throat> so striding bipedalism is a feature of hominids 
that's thought to occur when we diverged from chimpanzees about seven to six million years ago. But running is actually much more recent. And fossil evidence suggests that um, humans didn't really start running till about two million years ago. <clears throat> so about this time, two million years ago, we started to use stone tools, hand axe. It's before we had projectile weapons. We also changed our diet. We were starting to eat meat. So one thought is that we were partaking in what's called persistence hunting. So we were using activities that required much more endurance. So in 1996, Dr. Dr. Varkey at UCSD found a difference in the serum um, between humans and the great apes, the bonobos, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and the orangutans. And this was in the serum, it was a sialic acid called NU5AC. So humans have NU5AC, and the great apes have NU5GC. This is due to um, a mutation in a hydroxylase called CMAH that converts NU5AC to NU5GC. And this mutation also occurred about two million years ago. So there are two uh, major kinds of sialic acids on vertebrate cell surfaces and secreted molecules. And I just told you these are NU5AC in humans and NU5GC in the great apes. And they just differ in this one hydroxyl group. These are sugar molecules. <clears throat> so this is um, electron micrographs, but they were stained with lanthium nitrate, so you can start to see the sugar molecules. This is a capillary in a soleus, and you can see lots of these branch chain sugars, referred to as the glycocalyx here. We also stained a muscle fiber, and it also has a glycocalyx on its surface. So the sialic acids that we're talking about are at the ends of these branch sugar chains. So even though it's just one change in a hydroxyl group, there are millions of these sialic acids on the surface of all your cells. So this is a, a big global change throughout the system. Okay, so how could a change in the sugar residues on the surface of your cells influence the oxygen transport system? Okay, so when you change that hydroxyl group, you're going to change the charge. You're going to change the polarity on the surface of your cells. So this could influence the red blood cell dynamics, or how the red blood cell is flowing through those microvessels. Um, changing the surface sialic acids changes the charge, and it can also change the hydrophobicity of the membrane. So this could influence how the oxygen gets from the hemoglobin in the red blood cell across these diffusion barriers. This is sometimes referred to as the carrier-free region because in this region, oxygen is not bound to hemoglobin and it's not bound to myoglobin. And then I've also showed you that the myofiber has a glycocalyx on its surface, so it could influence how oxygen is taken up by the myofiber. So we've just started to think about this and how this could affect your exercise endurance. And so we have a CMAH null mouse. So in this condition, we're not trying to create a disease phenotype. We're actually trying to make the mouse a little bit more human-like. And we exercise tested these mice. And we did this um, in two conditions. We had sedentary mice, and that we had mice that were housed with running wheels for two weeks, so they were exercise trained. And you can see that the CMAH null mice ran for longer times on the treadmill than the wild type group. Exercise trained mice ran even longer, as you would expect, but the CMAH null mice that were exercise trained ran even farther on the treadmill. While the mice were housed in, with the treadmill, we recorded their speed and their distance every day. So this is a typical response with the voluntary exercise training. About uh, seven to 10 days, the response starts to even off or plateau. With, with the CMH null mice, they kept increasing their speed and increasing their distance. 
So this suggests that they had an improved exercise training response. They're training even better. We again measure fatigue using our in situ gastrocnemius complex response. And in this situation, we see um, that it took much longer for the muscles to fatigue. So they had a much improved fatigue response. We did measure the capillaries in some of these muscles. And in this situation, we see an increase in the number of capillaries in the soleus. We didn't see a change in the plantaris. Now, these mice were sedentary. They just remained in their little cages. So there's, this is not a training response. We're seeing an increase in the capillary number without training the mice at all. We wanted to know if the muscles were using oxygen more efficiently. And so what we did is we um, isolated some or dissected some fiber bundles and permeabilized them and then um, measured their oxygen consumption on a substrate inhibitor pro protocol with glutamate and malate as the substrate. So we did this in the diaphragm and in the soleus, and you can see that their oxygen consumption is increased. So they're using the same amount of oxygen more efficiently. In this um, slide, we uh, ran a metabolomics analysis, so we looked at their metabolites. And if you kind of step back and look at the big picture, you can see that there are up and down changes. There are changes with the CMH knockout. There are even more changes with exercise training. And these, there are even more changes in the exercise trained CMH no mice. If we run a pathway analysis on this data, the biggest hit was the pot pentose phosphate pathway. So this could mean that there's regulation of more oxidative stress in these more active muscle groups. We also saw changes in purine metabolism, lysine degradation, and protein synthesis, so protein turnover. We saw increases in some of the amino acids, like glycine, the branch chain amino acids. But a lot of these effects really just look like an exercise training response. We, if we didn't know that we had knocked out the gene, it would be kind of hard to distinguish if they were just exercised to different levels. OK, so some of the key takeaways from what I showed you today. We think that skeletal myofiber VHF is essential for the angiogenic response to exercise training, or um, at least partially. Um, that VEGF expressed by endothelial cells and myofibers is not required to main, ma maintain mature capillaries in a healthy mouse. But we do think that myofiber VEGF plays a role in contraction-induced perfusion of the hind limb skeletal muscle capillary bed. If there is an additional inflammatory burden, as would occur with like cigarette smoking, um, we see a loss of VEGF, a loss of capillary number, number and a lot of changes occurring in the myofiber itself. But humans who are really high oxygen users have been activated the CMH gene and the ability to convert new 5 ac to new 5 gc on the ends of the branch sugar chains. This biochemical change can potentially alter the polarity and the hydrophobicity of cell membranes. And this evolutionary change that occurred two million years ago is associated with an increase in endurance exercise capacity. Okay. Oh, there we go. OK, so I just wanted to thank the members of my lab that performed these experiments and our collaboration with Dr. Varkey. And we, work, we worked with um, close association with Peter Wagner and some of our funding sources from the NIH and the Tobacco-Related Disease Program. So thank you for listening. Um, hi, so I just had a question. So despite complete ablation of VGF in the skeletal muscle myofiber, you still observe an 18 and 25% respectively increase in capillary fiber ratio and capillary density in the plantaris. And I was just wondering, do you have a hypothesis that might support this observation? Well, I think that there's a lot of angiogenic growth factors that increase when you exercise. So they're going to have overlapping or redundant roles in the skeletal muscle. 
So I, I would suspect it's, it would be one of those. So Ellen, if I understood the, the evolutionary side of what you were saying there, um, do we know if apes or chimpanzees have exercise-induced angiogenesis? So am I misunderstanding that like, based on the, the gene that they have compared to us? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to adapt, whereas we are because we have yeah, right? I, I don't. I don't think that people have directly measured that, but they are. They they are like they have incredible strength, you know. They they jump and they move, but yeah. they're they're just not. They the just can't run. Well. Yeah, they can't maintain a um, extended exercise. So some, somebody needs to do the experiment of running chimps on a treadmill. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> or jumping in and out of trees. <laughs> Ellen, um, I was curious about the VEGF-induced perfusion. Do you have any ideas in terms of uh, mechanistically how that might happen? Mm -hmm. And also, um, you saw that effect with the, the early time point, but it didn't seem like it was occurring at a later, a later time, time point. point. Yeah, I, I think it's a nitric oxide uh, effect because we see changes in some of the nitric oxide synthesis. Um, but it gets back to this question, and we heard this in this meeting today, uh, I mean earlier in the sessions, that um, if, if you run a mouse on a treadmill and the VGF, the acute response goes up, and then you run the mouse again and the, it, the VGF goes up even less, and by five days, if you ran them on the fifth day, there's no more response. So somehow the, the vessels are adapting to their new state or condition. Um, but that's a, big, that's a hard question. I, that's a big question that I think needs to be answered. How do we go from those early responses to the, the training response? Mm -hmm. um, just in regards to his question, um, it was about the new 5AC conversion into new 5GC. Uh, so is that supposed to be indicative of the fact that the lack of new 5AC within primates is going to inhibit their oxidative capacity? I, so I think it's an oxygen availability, right? So we, we haven't nailed it on the head yet, but what it, what is saying is that they are, they are somehow um, using the oxygen available more efficiently, whether they are um, flowing their red blood cells to their, to where it needs to go more, or, um, the transfer of oxygen from the hemoglobin to the red, from the red blood cell to the muscle fiber is more efficient. Okay. I, I think it's one of those. Um, it, it's possible that they're actually storing a little bit more oxygen in their membranes. And it, it would be a small change, but it's happening in every cell membrane, in every cell throughout your whole body. The second question I had was in regards to the attenuation of uh, peripheral vascularization in response to the um, inhalation of cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. Is that going to run parallel or anti-parallel to the alveolar vascularization? So at the times that we're looking at the cigarette smoke, um, there's, it's before we are seeing any changes in the um, lung alveoli, so they don't have any emphysema yet. So with cigarette smoke, we, we did like up to four months. It takes like six, eight, ten months before you see changes in the lung. So I don't think that it's an impairment in the lung function bringing oxygen to the skeletal muscle. It's, it's more a direct uh, effect on the skeletal muscle. Okay. Thanks very much, Ellen.